Erev Tov, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. As today we we kicked off this morning the the summer series of uh, Torah Motion Online, our, our summer series. We hope to have a lot of opportunities to learn with you, and we encourage you to invite your friends, other people to join. Anything you've missed, we uh, I have recordings. We've started now putting up some of these talks on YouTube, so if people want to watch them on video, it's also afterwards. And uh, like always, we're interested to hear your feedback, comments, and and suggestions. Of course, you know, Dr. Mark has been doing these classes for, I don't know, 12 years or something. As I've mentioned before, we have over 200 of his talks. They're very well worth listening to on a range of so many people. Just now with, uh, you know, the turn of events in the world. So it's 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 picked up a little bit, 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 bit different. But uh, I do encourage you to listen to all the um, previous talks and the over a thousand other talks we have online. Um, those who were here last week know that uh, Dr. Shapiro ended the class by saying next week he'll talk on Dr. Lamb. Um, his correspondence with Dr. Lamb, little of course did we know that the Dr. Lamb would you know, pass away yesterday. Uh, he was really, I'm, I don't know how many people here knew him personally. He was of course the president of Yeshiva University when I was a student there. He was really a tremendous, tremendous leader, really one of the uh, the, the builders and molders of modern centrist orthodoxy, whatever you want to talk about, a phenomenal orator, uh, a great communal rabbi, a scholar, academic scholar, a, a Talmud Chacham, uh, you know, somebody who really he pushed what he believed in. He spoke uh, firmly for it and an amazing fundraiser. He raised uh, basically $2 billion for Yeshiva University. He saved it from from, from chapter 11, which was they, the fate they were going and that uh, he really will be missed and uh, whatever. So it just turns in and we are dedicating this evening's talk to his memory. Okay, good Dr. Shapiro, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Rabbi Kelman. And yes, we have a lot to say, but uh, as always, uh, before I do that, I just, we've been getting now with the YouTube, even more people and a number of comments sent to me. So let me just take two minutes or three minutes and then we'll move on uh, obviously back to the book, deal with Dr. Lamb. Um, um, I don't know if the person we spoke a little bit about TikTok last week is on there, but I did want to clarify that uh, when we spoke about this third type of Shiva, uh, it's not because not only because the words like Darche, which is plural already, Derachim, but what about, for example, Etchem? Um, you'd expect it to be Etchem, or the word we have in Miguel Sester, Sharvit. Why not Sharvit? Or we say in uh, Shema, Lavdo Bechol Avchem. There's no dagation to Dalit. So it's in order to explain that, that there is this theory of a second uh, Shiva. Incidentally, um, we have one example, uh, as far as I know, only one example, where um, after the, uh, the the movable Shiva, the Shiva Na, you have a dagesh, and that is the word Shite, two. And we think that dagesh is because a, a nun dropped. Uh, uh, David Eisen, a longtime listener for many, many years. Sometimes he's with us even in Israel live, uh, so he gets an award for that. Uh, regarding my leaving my tefillin. Remember the very first class um, when I went to, um, I spoke about how I went to Ethiopia and I went, left my, uh, the question was leaving my tefillin. In fact, I also said that I went with the great uh, Ari Zivotofsky. Here incidentally, you can see on the way there, we stopped in Egypt. There you can see on the right, that's uh, Rabbi Dr. Ari Zivotofsky. I'll, I'll mention him a little bit again later today. In the middle is my brother, and that is uh, me right there. So this takes us back to 1987. Um, David said me, Shlomo Karlbach has a book, the book about Shlomo Karlbach called Holy Brother. And he tells the same story I told how when he was in Russia, um, a, a Jewish boy who was going to be bar mitzvah, uh, he begged him for his tefillin. And Shlomo gave him the tefillin, because how could he not uh, uh, give him his tefillin? And then he asked him for his yarmulke, and he gave him his yarmulke. Okay, in terms of shuckling, uh, I, I don't want to get into it. There's a lot you could say. Those who are interested, please, you can read this book by Louis Jacobs, Hasidic Prayer. He has a whole chapter on it. He goes through everything. Um, incidentally, I didn't mention last week that the... Um, uh, the Ramah himself uh, mentions in Simon uh, Memchet 48 that uh, the Medaktakim would um, would shuffle. In the Kuzari that I mentioned also, uh, you can find it in uh, book two, I think it is seven, eight, chapter 80. He mentions uh, 
uh, shuckling in, um, in learning. That's because he said there's only one book for a group of people and you have to go like this to see the book. What I do want to add though, and many of you sent me uh, material, uh, I could give you a lot of that. I do want to read you something though. I sent it up. I posted on a blog post a long time ago. Let me just read it in Hebrew and tell you what it is about why shuckling. This is from a Hasidic text, Likuri Ikari. Those who know Hebrew, you'll get it. Those who don't know Hebrew, I'll sort of summarize it. Basically, he's comparing davening to sexual relations. And uh, I don't need to go any further. And that's why they're shuckling. Uh, uh, that's, it's, a, it's, a stand, it's a classic Hasidic text. And finally, the last... Two more things. Uh, thank you to Mel. I think Mel is correct when I said that in YU in the 50s and 60s, they used to go to Ramosha, Ravenkin for questions. Really, by the 60s, it was Ramosha. Uh, also, Mel pointed out to me that Ari Zivotofsky, the great Ari Zivotofsky, has a whole article, What's the Truth About Gal Yisrael? We mentioned that last class. He gives all the shitas. And what it comes down to is, Avid Kamar, Avid Kamar, Kamar Avid. Whatever you do, you're okay. Uh, but uh, most say that chazan should say out loud, but some say it's okay to say it quietly. Uh, one of you mentioned this book, and uh, Rabbi Polyakov's daughter was on with us last week, Minagelita. And yes, you will find it on page 21, where he says that the chazan must say it out loud. This is a very interesting book. I spoke a little bit about last week. I just was glancing through it, and you know he's a real stark litvak, because on page 68, he talks about how it's idolatry to do the upsharing. And that no good Lithuanian Jew would ever do that. But I asked my friend in Lakewood, he says, other than the real Litvakim, everyone in the yeshiva world, even the Litvaks, now do the upsharing. So if you want to see uh, Rabbi Polyakov, page 68, he, 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 the famous story with the Briskorov. Some guy brought uh, his son to the Briskorov to cut his hair on his third birthday. And the Briskorov said, I don't cut hair. I'm not a barber. But uh, even the modern Orthodox have gotten into it. It's a real party. And finally, the last thing, Hyman Schaffer. Okay, Hyman pointed out something which I knew and I wasn't sure, I didn't say it, and now you'll have to judge for yourself. Remember, I've been saying all this, how the book we're gonna start looking at in one minute is uh, the third Sefer ever published with Catholic money and the first two were the Kisve Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg. There is another one, but I wasn't sure if it's like a traditional Sefer. And I've mentioned this before at other occasions. And it was published by Paulist Press. I'll see if anyone gets it and can put it in. Paulist Press, I'm just reading about it. It's the uh, it's, it's, it's published by the Paulist Fathers, missionary priests, etc., etc. Rav Soloveitchik's Al Hachuva. Yes, Chaim Maltz has it. The English version by Pinchas Peli was published by Paulist Press. So why didn't I mention that? I didn't mention it because it's English. You know, is a safer in English. I guess, I mean, today, I guess a lot of Sfarim, my like Blech's books, I remember, you know, some guy writing about how they're the most important Sfarim in our time. He's obviously a Lachu centric guy who said that, but would anyone deny that they're Sfarim? So I, I guess, I guess, Rav, but that means they're of Solovacious Alachuva, as far as I know in English, is the first safer ever published by Catholics. And uh, maybe so, because, you know, on Lonely Man of Faith, was first delivered at a Catholic seminary in Brighton, Massachusetts, if you can believe this. Uh, so I, I'm happy if I have to give up the, um, the glory to anyone, it best be to be Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, I, I guess Alachinfa in English is a safer. Um, maybe, I mean, it's a translation of a safer, but okay. So um, now we move, uh, we begin again, continuing with Igros um, Malche Rabbanan. Uh, the book I published, the letters, one of you was so impatient, you said, well, what are you going to do after this? So this is going to take us many weeks, but if we're still inside and we can't go out, I can start doing the Kiss for Rebichiak of Weinberg, volume one, Halacha, volume two on Hashkafa. Oh, the history of the Gedoli, we'll be here for another few years. Um, and as Rabbi Kelman said last week, the next Simon, Simon 13, Yud Gimel, is uh, my chorus and response with Rabbi Lamb. So I was going to tell you, of course, as I always did, uh, I didn't think I need to tell you really about who Rabbi Lamb was, but I will now in light of the events. You know, his wife also just passed away about a month ago and he was preceded by a daughter, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I was gonna tell you uh, 
what, what led me to him, our connection, and uh, the question, because it's a very interesting uh, uh, question. But since, um, you know, of his passing, and there's a lot been written about him, you can go online, why well, you sent out something tomorrow, they're having the eulogy, and um, Rav Schechter is also speaking, and I'm very curious to hear that, because he, at times, was at odds with uh, Rabbi Lamb, Dr. Lamb, in terms of the direction of the yeshiva. So, um, well, it'll be interesting to see that. And um, so let me just say a little bit about Dr. Lamb that you might not know, not the standard things. And uh, he's born in 1927. He went to Torah Vidas. So uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Torah Vidas, which was originally founded by, uh, I'll show you something in a minute. Uh, founded by um, leaders, including from the Mizrahi, Zeb Gold and others, it, they have a website. Yeshiva Torah Vidas has a website. It's, it, here's a Haredi Yeshiva with a website. And on the website, it has a list of yearbooks. Every yearbook that they have, they don't have Dr. Lamb's because his, I believe, would be in 1944. It goes 43 to 45. And then they, um, um, it ends like 78. I think that's the last one when they stopped doing a yearbook, I guess. But if you look through it, it's incredible because you see so many great people, so many people who made a mark. And it wasn't Haredi Yeshiva like we think of today. Um, I, I've downloaded all the yearbooks because I have a feeling maybe they're gonna be taken off. Let me give you an example. So because you think of Dr. Lamb and you say, oh, we can't went to Tarvadas. So many people went to Tarvadas. Let me just show you just one page, which someone sent me. I found other interesting stuff, but I was, I was looking for great names of rabbis and other leaders. I wasn't reading like this, but someone else sent me this. I wanna show you, um, just to give you an example um, of the um, page. This is from the yearbook, one of the yearbooks. It's from 1941. Um, um, Take a look at the guy on top, Irving Dropkin. Maybe some of you know him, if he's alive, I hope so. Absolutely free of all conceit. As an athlete, chink is hard to beat. As a Don Juan, well, let's not debate. Just ask the girls who live in Seagate. Uh, so you get a sense. Now, uh, Am I saying that the, the rabbis were happy with this? Of course not, they're probably furious. But if we did something like that at JEC, we're out of high school, they also would be furious, the rabbis. What it says is though, it shows you about the students, that the students, uh, this is what they were like. Today, the students of, uh, of um, Tarvadas wouldn't dream of anything like that. I mean, talk about girls or anything. Uh, so clearly it's a different sort of yeshiva. And there's probably many of you who remember, it was more to the right, of course, than YU. But the, the students going came from all sorts of backgrounds. And when you say it was more to the right of YU, yeah, it was. But let me show you some other things uh, uh, which come from Torah Vadas. Um, hold on a second. Um, this is from Torah Vadas. They sent out after the state of Israel was formed a special um, uh, Haggadah. And look at the picture here of Israel, the pioneers. Here's another one. This is right in the Haggadah. And look at this. Hold on to your seats. Look how the women are dressed. And this is sent out by Torah Vadas. In fact, I have to tell you that um, this book was just appear appeared. You see this big thick one here? It's called America's Yeshiva. Uh, not Yisus Torvadas, 1919. Okay, look how thick it is. It's, it's a whole beautiful uh, picture book. The pictures are unbelievable. All about uh, Torah Vadas, of the, about the time when Dr. Lamb was there. I don't think he's mentioned at all in the book, but all sorts of other people mentioned. They, they tell the truth that about Zev Gold, the, the leader of the Mizrahi, signer of the Israel Declaration of Independence, how he was involved very much in founding the yeshiva. That isn't the case, by the way, in the, uh, if you look in uh, the video they put out, they don't mention Zev Gold at all. But uh, it's in here so much. Uh, I believe that this book, this great big book, was written by a few different people because although the first half of the book has all the history, including the march, there's a big march of, of the yeshiva and they're holding the Zionist flag in the march. When you get to the end, things are a little different because they talk about uh, the new Rosh, Rosh Yeshiva they have, and they go through every Rosh Yeshiva, discuss them, or Palm, or Gedal Yeshur, or Then they get to the more modern ones. 
And two of the modern Rosh Yeshiva, by the way, are the two ones today. One is named Rav Yosef Savitsky, and the other is Rav Yitzhak Lichtenstein, who was appointed a few years ago. So um, it's interesting because uh, Rav Mordechai Savitsky and Rav Soloveitchik did not get along very well. They were actually at odds with each other in the early years. In fact, during the Kashras controversy where Savitsky was on the other side, later on, they, uh, they did get together, but in the early years, not. So now their descendants of Sermi is Rosh Hashim. But let me read you what it says on, uh, towards the end of our Ritzach Lichtenstein. Rav Yitzhak Lichtenstein, a descendant of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik and a grandson through marriage of Rav Ruven Grozovsky, you know, he came to lead the yeshiva. So no mention of the father and no mention of the grandfather. And it's not like Yitzhak Lichtenstein has uh, gone off to the Haredi side and forget his root, forgot his roots. He actually published his grandfather's Haggadah and other works of his grandfather. And it's like, who are they trying to fool? Everyone knows who his father is and everyone knows who his grandfather is. So it's not like it's a cover up like usually you see in Haredi literature where they don't want you to know about it. Uh, they know that everyone reading it knows about it. And so that was that was disappointing. But that's, it, it's a different era. The um, the school that um, Dr. Lamb goes to and where he gets his early Torah, although he got a lot of Torah, of course, also maybe more from his uh, family. He has an uncle and a grandfather in particular. He's an uncle who's a Mechaber Sefer, Balmo, and a grandfather of Yeshua Balmo, the author of the Emek um, Halacha. He was an important Rav in New York. Also related to near, uh, uh, Torah Vadas because Torah Vadas had this problem um, in the early years of the Yeshiva. You had these guys called the Malachim. These were like religious fanatics uh, who started dressing in all black, long coats and wearing tzitzis out. <laughs> Today, maybe one seem fanatical, growing beards, that sort of stuff. And Rashaiga Five Mendelwitz wanted to throw them out of the yeshiva. They weren't following the rules. And he writes to Rabbi Baumel, and you could look it up. It's volume two, number 28. And you can read about how uh, Rabbi Balmo writes to him, Halacha Maisa, that you can, it, it, the tshuva is about one person in particular, but we know it's about all of them. Throw them out, and they were thrown out. The Shagha Faisal Mendelitz threw them out of the yeshiva. And that's, um, that's Rabbi Lamb's grandfather. After finishing, of course, you have to go to college. Everyone went to college in those days. This is before the Lakewood Revolution. So the question was, do you go to Brooklyn College, Queens College? Uh, do you go at full time? Do you go at night? Do you go to Columbia? Do you go to YU? And uh, he went to YU and um, he uh, got smicha at YU. And then he becomes a rabbi in Springfield, Massachusetts, the home of the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. There used to be a number of shuls. They've all now combined Orthodox shuls. But his shul was Congregation Kadima, where he comes in 53, or 50, end of 53, I think, Rosh Hashanah. He took over for another rabbi who had uh, just finished up about 18 years, Isaac Klein. Isaac Klein, Yeshiva College graduate, started at Yeshiva Sermit Zohanan and switched to the seminary. Isaac Klein, one of the three people to get personal smicha from Louis Ginsburg. The others were Louis Finkelstein and Boaz Cohen, the author of the, you know, the conservative code of conservative uh, code of Jewish law. It's like a Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch in English. And if you took out the stuff dealing with cheese and wine, any Orthodox Jew would have no problem using it. But he was the rabbi of the Orthodox Shul there. Uh, Lamb was there only a few years, actually before, and he was, when he was a YU, uh, right before he went there, he was assistant rabbi, I should say, at KJ. He'd soon go to the Jewish Center, just like Mordechai Kaplan was at the KJ and then found the Jewish Center. But then he comes back to New York City in 59, he had thought, incidentally, of going on to a career in the sciences. He was a chemistry major, but uh, he was convinced to devote his time to Torah. And he starts teaching at uh, YU Jewish philosophy, but he doesn't have an advanced degree. It's then he starts working on his dissertation. He has the distinction, Dr. Lamb, of the only PhD ever directed by Rabbi Soloveitchik. And this was, his, it's, it came out in Hebrew and in English uh, in the 80s. Uh, it came out in Hebrew earlier on Rechaim of Elijah. Um, and uh, so he has smicha, and um, and he was obviously very close to the Rav. He wrote it on Rav Chaim Belajan, something very close to the Rav's heart, the idea of uh, Torah Lishma. Uh, at this time, he's working at as the Jewish center. He's the uh, the rabbi there, and um, I mean he was there for many many years. Uh, I should, I'll show you, not that many years, a decade. And then he's chosen to become president of YU. What's significant about his time there is that um, well, a number of things. First, he he starts tradition, the journal. That still continues. Um, he um, 
he was very influential in the Upper West Side. Uh, of course, that was, it's a center of uh, Jewish money, Orthodox money and community. And he was a great orator. We heard it from Rabbi Kelman. Very unusual. He wrote out every one of his sermons word for word. You can go on the YU website, the archives, and you could see all his sermons. They uploaded all of them. And he dealt with all the issues under the sun. And you see him saying things which today might uh, seem, he wouldn't maybe say them today because he's talking about, you know, maybe there will be rabbis for women rabbis in the future. You know, I'm not going to opine on it, but he's not like saying absolutely not. And you find all, someone wrote me today asking, he was looking at the sermons and really, Lamb in 19, um, I think he said it was in 65 or 64, is 65, I think he said, he is writing about how we have to, you know, stress the mitzvah of Matanos, of Mishloch Manot. He says it's a mace mitzvah. He says, no one does Mishloch Manot. And the person asked me, and I didn't know this either. He goes, that's, I guess, on the Upper West Side in the 60s, people weren't doing Mishloch Manot. There wasn't, uh, you have to ask people who lived during that time, uh, but that he gives a whole sermon on it, so at least in his show, um, people were not following that. So, a, a great orator. Um, he, he writes scholarship during his time, he writes Torah during his time, and he makes himself a reputation as one of the leaders of American orthodoxy, American, you know, born and bred, someone who's able to speak about the, the, the problems of the day, everything from the sexual revolution to the homosexuality. He writes the first article on halakha and homosexuality, uh, pre presents a possible solution, uh, treating homosexuals as ones, that they really, they're sort of like forced into doing what they're doing. Um, so maybe we can judge them, not the way the harsh judgments of the Talmud. Uh, really very important. In one of his early articles, he publishes in the Jewish Quarterly Review, he was Zoha, at least he thought he was Zoha, for a very harsh response by the great Harry Wolfson, the premier scholar of Jewish philosophy. And I asked Dr. Lamb once, because here he's a young academic, scholar, rabbi academic, and he publishes this, and the leading authority in the world on Jewish philosophy blows him away. <laughs> Uh, so I asked him, like, oh, how'd you feel? Uh, were you embarrassed? He says, no, no, I felt a lot of pride. The fact that Harry Wolfson thought it was worth his time to write a whole essay to show why I was wrong. It's like what people said with Narav Shear. If the Rav called on you and then said you're an Amaretz or anything, you don't feel embarrassed. You feel good that at least he thought that your idea was worth criticizing rather than just ignoring you. And I've heard the same thing of people who are in uh, Lieberman's class as well. He becomes president of YU, as uh, Rabbi Kelman mentioned, the school was in very difficult circumstances. Lamb was preceded by two important presidents, Iluyim, unbelievable big Tommy Dechachami, Revel, Bernard Revel, and uh, Samuel Belkin. Samuel Belkin was from the Chavis Chaim, uh, um, who also became great scholars, um, academic scholars, but they never really published every, anything. They, uh, Belkin's great work on Philo was only after his death it came out. Uh, he publishes one book, this, um, which is his dissertation. The same with Revel. You know, running a university, you know, raising money, uh, that's the main job, uh, waiting enough time to write. This is going to be Lamb's unbelievable achievement, even though he becomes president. He becomes president when Bel Belkin had almost bankrupted the university. For all of his wonderful achievements and what he built, he was a great builder, he almost bankrupted it. Lamb was able to rebuild raise enormous amounts of money. I asked him once, how did you raise money? I can see you raise money. It's a full-time job for the university. You have to raise money for a medical school, for a law school. How do you, and he explained that, you know, each different people you go, you raise it differently. And yet throughout all that, most people, academics, they become deans, they become presidents. You kiss academic scholarship goodbye. When do you have the time? Certainly president of university. They give you a fancy place in New York. You're supposed to have meetings every night. You're having your meeting. When do you have time to write? I don't know how he did it. I could say the same thing about Jonathan Sachs. I don't know how he did it either. Uh, but uh, Norman Lamb was able to continuously write throughout his time as president. And uh, let me just say, and that, that's going to get to the point where we could talk about our correspondence. Just a couple other things. Um, he, I mean, he presided over an era where uh, Yeshiva University growth. On the other hand, many people will historically will look and say it was under his time that the school went to the right. And they'll blame him for that. I, I don't know if you can, I mean, if you think it's a good thing, then uh, you know, get the credit. But many people in the modern Orthodox world are unhappy with the direction of YU. You know, that's the world though. The world was moving to the right. Uh, Lamb, I don't think he ever changed. He did say that we don't need to term modern Orthodox, he wanted centrist, but he, I don't think he ever changed. Uh, um, you know, the, the leading Rosh Yeshiva more and more on the right. Had Ravuchtasin remained in America instead of blaming uh, 
this on Norman Land, you could remember Varun Lichtenstein that certain people have, that he abandoned America. Had he remained in America, he would have been the real successor of the Rav. Uh, so I, I don't think that's a criticism of Norman Lamb. Norman Lamb remained, Rosh, he was also a Rosh Hashiva, and he was able to be a Rosh Hashiva. This is what we have to remember. The first three presidents of YU were also, I'm not going to say that Lamb was a Talmud Chacham like uh, Belkin uh, or um, a Revel, but he certainly was a fine Talmud Chacham, one who could give a shear, who did give a shear to the university. He published uh, halachic articles. He published a whole sefer. Um, it was, he, he was a really a uh, Renaissance man, uh, Ishesh Kovot, and of course he did what Belkin and De Revel did not do. Not only write on scholarship, be a spokesman for modern orthodoxy, confronting the issues of the day, whatever the issues are, be it, you know, uh, as I said, sexual ethics, be it, uh, uh, you know, politics, situation in Israel, in a way that his pre predecessors did not. He was appointed president. Unfortunately, we don't have the story of that. But we have a book about YU by Jeffrey Gurak. And yet the whole thing is glossed over. He becomes president. And yet we know that that was a serious uh, election with strongly held feelings. Now, why didn't Gurak write about this? Uh, I never really asked him. You can ask him, I'm sure it's being Riverdale. The fact that he was uh, Lamb's academic assistant when he wrote it, uh, um, in addition to being uh, you know, the professor in the, uh, of American Jewish history at YU might be the reason. I don't know, but I don't see how you could write a book on YU and uh, not talk about the presidency where you had two leading figures. You had Emmanuel Rackman, also a, a major figure in modern orthodoxy at the time, who was very much involved with Yeshiva University. Uh, he was Belkin's right-hand man. In fact, I don't believe it, but Rackman told me that the Rav was on his side. The reason I don't believe it is because uh, Chaim Soloveitchik is known to have gone into the board meeting and started reading things from Rackman's writings and says, we can't have him as president. Uh, but, uh, and there, there must be minutes somewhere of the meetings to find out uh, Maury Weiss, I believe his, was involved with this uh, through his father-in-law, I guess. I don't know if he himself was at the meetings, but this became a big conflict. Is it gonna be Rackman who had many important backers or Lamb? Had Rackman been appointed, the university would have probably gone to the left, uh, uh, certainly went to go to the right. Lamb was appointed. Uh, again, I don't know the inner politics. All we know are the rumors and everything. So Rackman then feels he has to leave. He goes to Israel and becomes the chancellor of Bar Ilan University. Uh, so it's one of those great what ifs if Rackman had become um, uh, president. So let's let me leave it at that and just say that um, in terms of the scholarship, he wrote a very important book. Here it is. Um, it's called The Encounter of Religious Learning and Worldly Knowledge in the Jewish Tradition. Many of you are YU uh, graduates, so you know this, but for those who aren't, you should know that the, the term Torah umada, Torah and science, really Torah, and, it's understood mada in a larger sense of Western civilization. I don't know why they picked the word mada, but uh, maybe because scientific Judaism, uh, that's the slogan, the model of YU. And it's always been a problematic slogan because on the one hand, the administration always advocates it and the presidents have always advocated it. You can even go back to uh, Revel look in Rakefet's biography, which has these his addresses at the graduations, and you can see Revel always pushing this. But we know that the Rosh Yeshiva often were completely opposed to it. Uh, the Rav, of course, was not. The Rav was the biggest backer of, uh, of least secular studies at the university. I'm not saying he believed in the ideology of the synthesis we're gonna see, which he did not. Um, but she, there never was a, a, actually a, a book length exposition. Why you used to have this thing called the Torah Mata Reader, which I had an essay from Mavar Lichtenstein and some other stuff that he would pass out to all freshmen. Norman Lamb decided he was going to actually write a book explaining the, the philosophy of, um, of Torah Umada. It's copyright 1990. And if you look at the, the preface of the book, he writes how um, he began prepare the, how, you know, he, how did he write the book? He says that he began to prepare it in Jerusalem in the home of Herman and Ursula Merkin important German Orthodox family, became big backers of um, Yeshiva University. Uh, the Merkins are, um, well, if you want to learn about them, maybe not such good stuff, you can read about Daphne Merkin, what she has to say about them in uh, her memoir. But I, uh, this is uh, the Breuer family. Uh, Herman Merkin's um, uh, wife is the sister of um, Isaac Breuer, that makes the uh, granddaughter of uh, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch which is significant because the Hersheyans in Washington Heights uh, treated YU like it was in Hiram. 
Uh, they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, Daphne Merkin, you can read uh, what she has to say. But, uh, um, I'd encourage you not to actually, but if you want to. Uh, and then he says, the month of quiet contemplation in the lovely surroundings of Yarnton Manor in England as the guest of the Oxford Hebrew Study Center. And then it goes on, the competent and loyal assistance of my academic assistant, Professor Jeffrey F. Gurak, et cetera. Okay, that's where I come in because I was a seat. Lamb tells us that he went to Oxford for a month. He was given, I guess, a sabbatical of a month and uh, he could go there and uh, he used to go up in the summer to Camp Morishah. Those of you who went to Morishah, you might remember, but uh, to work on this book that he gave in, at, uh, in, Yarnt, in Oxford, he gave a whole lecture on it. Yarnton Manor was a place that was owned by the Oxford Hebrew Center. Center for Hebrew and Judaic Studies, and it was uh, they sold it about seven years ago. It was a uh, it was a manor with like uh, ten different houses on it, and a, uh, a library, a place to eat. You you're there, you feel like uh, you're a nobility for old, and that's what it was. It was an old manor from the nobility, and that was owned by the Oxford Hebrew Center. And I was in Oxford at the Oxford Hebrew Center um, in. Uh, you know, he, in 1987 to 88. And that's, the book is published in 90, but that was the year. And uh, Norman Lamb came during uh, my time there. It was a, uh, it was a great time there. Um, incidentally, before I go on, I just want to say one more thing. Um, we heard today, this morning, and I encourage everyone to listen to Dov Zakon. Uh, it's on YouTube now. After Norman Lamb left the presidency when he retired, he, they offered the job to Dov Zakai. Actually, I mean, they voted. It was an official offer. It was his for the taking. And he chose not to take it uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then they decided to go to Richard Job. So getting, I, I think I remember that because I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, Dov Zakai also uh, uh, studied in um, Oxford. But um, uh, so getting back to the story. Uh, so I was in Oxford for, yes, he was in Oxford also, uh, Dov Zakai. Uh, but many, many interesting people were there. It was a, they would pass through Yarnton. They'd go come for a week, two weeks, a month. Uh, I, Yitzhak um, Gilat was there uh, when I was there. Uh, Michal Schwartz. Michal Schwartz, uh, the, uh, the great scholar. Let me get a picture up here for you for him. The great scholar of uh, a Jewish philosophy who uh, retranslated the Rambam. Uh, here, I'll show you a picture of him here. Um, let me get a picture for you. Um, um, Eliezer Don Yechiel, many, many people were there. Here's a picture of um, Michal Schwartz. He translated the Marnevuchim from Arabic into, he died a few years ago, Arabic into Hebrew. This is now the standard edition. Um, I remember I brought him to the Chabad to eat. Um, I saw him once um, in the, um, there was a restaurant today. I don't think we would do that, but there was a vegan restaurant there which we all would eat at. Uh, by the way, in terms of, the, there's a letter, which is not in the book. We'll get, after we finish the book, we'll deal with the letters that aren't in the book, one that came in too late from a Shabtai Khan Rappaport about vegan restaurants. But um, I saw him in there reading, learning with a Gemara in the restaurant. So uh, his, his, he focused on philosophy and the Rambam, but on his free time, he learned Gemara. So I, I was there with him. It was the year before um, um, Boteach. The two years before Shmuley Boteach and Cory Booker. So Norman Lamb comes to spend his time there. And I, uh, I got to meet him. In fact, I asked him to speak to the Orthodox students. At, um, we were having, first of all, we would have dinner every night at the Oxford Shul. And um, we would daven with them on Shabbos. The problem was the machitza was low, really low. The women were in the back and it was quite low. And there was a big machokas, and some people were threatening to leave, form their own minion, but it was a problem because we ate with there. And so Norman Lamb comes, he speaks to the group, and uh, we have, um, he gives a very nice uh, presentation. He had dinner with us, and then in the question and answer, someone asks him about the machitza. What does he think? And he looks at it and says, you know, it could be a little bigger, but when I went to the Jewish center, it also was very small. And after I've heard everything that the community does for you, they feed you and everything, I wouldn't make it a big deal about it. Just stick with it for now. And uh, and once he said that, that was it. No more uh, dispute, no more saying anything. So get to the book now. Uh, he publishes uh, Torah. 
the, the uh, book Torah Maga. And um, if you look on, well, let me read you what I just wrote here. Um, this is my letter. I have, I wrote to him in English also, but this is in Hebrew. So the Hebrew is, um, um, is what I include in the book. He had a little English and the rest is Hebrew. One of the letters to him, he didn't, to me, he didn't reply. He gave it to J. David Bleich. And this has been quoted a number of times, in particular by Michael Broyd in his book on the legal practice of Jewish law. I wrote to Lamb asking, what's the justification to have a law school? A lot of these lawyers are going to come out and they're going to violate Jewish law by suing people and everything. J. He gives it to J. David Bleich. J. David Bleich wrote me a three or four page letter uh, explaining you know, the justification behind Cardozo and law school from halachic standpoint, very interesting. Uh, okay, so I wrote to Dr. Lamb as follows. Um, if you look in his book on page 160, well, before I do this, let me try to say something first. The Rambam in the Mishnah Torah is he Lamb tries to show different models of Torah Madi. Hasidic model, not to say that Hasidim would ever be Torah Madi, but that Hasidim, you know, they, they uh, have see holiness even in secular things, the Rambam, et cetera, et cetera. Hirsch, Shem, Shem, Rafa, Hirsch, Rav Cook. The thing about the Rambam is the Rambam doesn't, uh, you're probably gonna think I'm crazy when I tell you this, but it's true. The Rambam does not believe in secular studies. I know everyone goes around saying the Rambam supports secular studies and people are think Shapiro's crazy. Shapiro, what, I'm, I'm living in Williamsburg or something. The Rambam doesn't believe in secular studies. But I mean it, the Rambam does not believe in secular studies. The Rambam, in, um, he speaks against the study of history. It's a waste of time. Uh, he, you know, poems, he, he's not into any of that stuff. The Rambam's into Torah. But for the Rambam, Torah is much broader. If you look at the Mishnah Torah in uh, Sefer Madan, Yesodi HaTorah, that's the beginning of the Mishnah Torah. Yesodi HaTorah is the essence the, of the Torah. The first four chapters, the Rambam has science and philosophy. And then he, it says at the end that this is part of Gemara, and this is the essence of the Torah. This is the most important. This is, uh, this is the big stuff. And then the Talmudic disputations, that's, that's small compared to this. The Ramon doesn't believe in secular studies. He has expanded what Torah studies are. Rav Kafa has an article called Rimude Chol, in quotation marks, secular studies in the Rambam. The Rambam just has a much broader understanding of what Torah is. And this is not Torah Umada in the sense, when we think of the Rambam didn't believe in Torah Umada. The Rambam believed in Torah, but Mada is Torah. So for, for instance, uh, I think it's, uh, maybe it's Mitzvah number 77, I think, you have to love God. How do you love God? Well, who's God that you can love him? You don't know him. So the Rambam explains it's an intellectual love. What does that mean, intellectual love? You understand about science, you understand about the world, the creation. You, today, you could say, for example, you learn about the human eye and how that's, and then you're brought into wonder of God's creation. And that brings you to an intellectual love of God. This is part of Torah. And therefore, science is a necessity to fulfill the mitzvah of loving God and to understand so much more. So it's basic. And it's in the Rambam. He doesn't hide this. This is not some one of the secrets of the Marna or anything. It's right there in the Mishnah Torah. So I am reading Lamb's book on page 164. His Lamb gives a whole exposition and uh, exactly what I'm saying. And then he says, however, do you therefore make Birkas Torah for studying uh, organic chemistry? Or equally absurd. I don't know why it's absurd. It's not absurd at all. But he says, equally absurd. Then he says, may you study calculus all day and thereby be exactly exempt from other Talmud Torah that day. Um, I, I might say it's absurd for a different reason because calculus doesn't work here. Calculus for the Rambam is sort of like, um, it's something that's like a, 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 an appurtenance. It helps you to learn. You study calculus so you can understand Kiddush HaChodesh or things like that. The Rambam never says that the mathematics per se, the Ralbag does, but not the Rambam will bring you Olam Haba or anything like that. So, uh, but chemistry and the Rambam and Lamb says explicitly, no, the Torah blessing is restricted to quote, texts of Torah and the review, explication and analysis of those texts. He says, so texts of Torah. What does that mean, texts of Torah? He says that the pardes, which is all this philosophy, which I mentioned, that's uh, uh, Talmud Torah, but uh, we don't say a bracha on it. He says the study of physics done in the proper manner is an active study of Torah, but requires no blessing. I understand this. So I wrote to him. I wrote to Dr. Lamb and I said, what's going on here? Uh, 
Um, what's the basis that you say that the Ramam calls this? Um, um, here, I'll read it to you. The uh, second here, um, the word for word, what the Rambam uh, says. Um, just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, Yesodia Torah, chapter four, right at the end, after going through all the stuff, he talks about the Pardes and uh, he says that this, the, the, the philosophy I've spoken about, uh, uh, this is uh, Maise Merkava. Um, and Maise Merkava, we know uh, that that's the most important thing. And what's a Dover Katan? A lesser thing? That's the Havaya da Varava. That's Talmudic argumentation. Only after you study Havaya da Varava. What he says, Leda, to know the Isser, Usser, Vamutar, then can you move on to the bigger stuff? How could you not say Birkas of Torah? You're studying the essence of Torah. Yesodia Torah. How could, so what, I asked him, what's your basis, Dr. Lamb, um, for this? Because he doesn't, uh, he just says it without uh, explaining it. And he replies to me that I should, uh, he tells me to look in the, the Gemara, in Rahus, and uh, he says, it says there that you say the Birchas Torah on Mikra, Midrash, Mishnah, Talmud. And then he says, based on this, we see that it has to be a text of Torah. I wasn't satisfied because if you look in, uh, uh, in Hilchus Talmud Torah, chapter one, in my book, it says chapter 11, such so a chapter 12. And you have to see different versions divided differently. A section of Talmud, the Rabbim includes as part of Talmud, study of the Pardes. He said that explicitly. In um, if you look in Hilchos Talmud Torah uh, eleven, he says you should divide your day into three parts: a third in Torah Shabbatav, a third in Torah Shabbat Peh, and a third in Yaskil Achari Davam Rishon. Understanding, argumentation, etc. And then he says uh, this is called uh, Talmud. And uh, if you look in number twelve, there. He says that uh, that the matters that are called pardes, and we know what pardes is. Pardes are all the philosophy. Philosophy he speaks about bichah Talmud is included as part of Talmud. So the, that would be explicitly yes. So the Dr. Lamb writes back to me. He says no. Um, he says, well, look what the Ramam says in uh, Hilchos Talmud Torah, and compare it to what he says in Hilchos Tfila, where in Hilchos Tfila he says that uh, when you get up in the morning before learning Torah. He says, Hamashkin le cross Torah. If you get up to read Torah before Kriyat Shema, he says, whether you read Torah Shvichtar or Torah Shabal Peh, you have to make a bracha. And uh, and then, so he says, Torah Shvichtar or Torah Shabal Peh. And then, if you look in, uh, if you look in Hilchos Talmud Torah, Perak Aleph, Halach Yud Aleph, he says, you divide your day. Three three ways: Torah Shabbatav, Torah Shabbat Peh, and then, as we already saw, that uh, to understand uh, the argumentation. But he says, says if you look back in Hilchos Tfila, when he says that you have to make the bracha, he's only referring to the two first parts: Torah Shabbatav and Torah Shabbat Peh. That's what you make a bracha on. In other words, you don't, and that's the first two of the way you divide your day to three. The third part, which is um, he calls it. Yavin Viaski Lachari Dover Marishito, the Yoti Dover Midover, the Yidma Dover Dover, the Adim Minas Torah and Justice by Hand, etc., etc. You don't make a bear because of Torah. And that, and that thing, that's uh, part, the parties is included. That's his answer. All I can say is it makes no sense at all to me. Based upon what Rabbi Lamb writes, if I sit down for an hour and explain to you uh, an analysis of Svara of the Katsosa Hoshen, you wouldn't make bear because of Torah? Okay, if you read the Katsosa Hoshen, I think Dr. Lamb would also agree you make it because it's a text of Tarsha Lavet. But how about I just explain to you a Svara? Or how about we sit together and like um, my, my son, God willing, he'll be in yeshiva next year. So uh, they sent out like a shear. Um, do you count, is the first, should belief in God be counted as the first mitzvah? That was a shear they sent out before Shavuos. We can have a whole conversation for an hour speaking philosophically. Are we saying that that's not part of... Um, uh, that's part of the pardes. Well, you wouldn't say Birkas Torah for that? I think you would. So then how do I, how would you explain the, um, the Rambam's Lashon? I think it's, uh, he's just saying you get up and you, uh, I mean, I, it's difficult maybe, uh, 
But he says, he says, you get up and uh, whether you were in Torah Shabbat or Torah Shabbat, yeah. um, maybe over there, this is included in Torah Shabbat. I don't know. I, I see what Rabbi Lamb's point is. On the other hand, the other side is it leads you to this unbelievably, in my mind, strange result that to st that Yisode HaTorah, which he tells us, which Lamb himself tells us is the essence of Talmud Torah, you wouldn't make a Birkas Torah on it? I don't know. I find it very difficult, uh, even though you have that text in the Rambam that he cites. Uh, okay, that's so. Let me uh, move on to another very interesting thing. Uh, so that was my, I, I had more other dealings with Dr. Lang. Uh, good conversations with him when I once was in the Upper West Side at the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. He honored me by coming uh, to all my classes. We spoke privately and uh, he told me all sorts of stuff, which uh, at the moment I don't want to reveal it, but he thought it should be revealed. Uh, just uh, his, uh, his views on uh, certain issues of the day. And I'm not saying I was close to him at all. Uh, but uh, the few times we were together, uh, um, I learned a great deal, and um, I was happy to, even though it was a short letter, I was happy to be able to include this uh, in the book. Um, um, now, the next letter, um, number uh, 14, this I need to give you a background to, uh, give you a background as well, because it's, it's from, let me show you his picture here. Um, from a great rabbi. He hasn't been well the last uh, couple of years. Um, um, here he is, Rabbi Yehuda Herzl Hengib. The um, He's the grandson of um, the great uh, Rav Yosef Eliyahu Hengib, uh, the Posek of New York, really the leading Posek in New York before uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein. None of Rabbi Hengib's children, whom he all, he sent them all to Yeshiva College. But none of his sons became uh, great Talmudic scholars. Uh, one of them became an internationally known lawyer, Louis Hankin. Um, and um, he had a grandson, though. He has a grandson, um, Rabbi uh, Yehuda Rotzel Hankin, who was in America. I believe he went to Flatbush, then he went to Columbia, and uh, he's been in Israel now for many years. Um, the father of Eitam Hankin, who we mentioned uh, in previous class, a uh, very, very big Talmud Chacham author of four volumes, responsa called um, the Nevani. Interesting questions. He's really, he's one of the post scheme in the modern Orthodox orbit, answering questions from the modern Orthodox world. And he himself is in that orbit. His wife start, started the school Nishmat. The whole idea of uh, Yoetzet comes out of them. And he was the halachic advisor, the halachic authority behind this. Uh, one thing I can say, and I did say this to his wife, I never told him personally, we used to communicate uh, a good deal. He used to read my blog posts and send me information on them. Um, there's a real problem with his safer. You take a look at Ramosha Feinstein's Igros Moshe, very important work. You can chart the history to a certain extent of American orthodoxy from his work, because you see who he's writing to, you see the problems. And this could also even have halachic significance. And Ramosha writes an answer to Berkeley, California, as he does to the Chabad House in Berkeley, the answer, when you see the answer given there, well, you know, had he been writing to Muncie or Brooklyn, it might be a completely different answer. So it's important for a variety of reasons to know who the letters are being written to. Rabbi Hudrotzel Henkin never tells you who he writes to. He writes Lichvod and then just leaves the name out. So you have no idea. And that, that, I don't like that. You know, we learn as people who study the history of Halacha and Responsa, you learn a great deal about who was in correspondence. And when you see, for instance, that a, like a really right-wing rabbi is corresponding with a left-wing or a Hasidic with an anti-Zionist or an anti-Zionist with a Zionist, it's interesting. I have a number of letters from Maya Hankin. The one we're going to speak to about now is um, it's not the most famous. Two of these letters became very famous. The, the other one we'll speak about is quoted all over the place. And no one knows who he wrote to. Now they do. This is titled, Aliyah Kofer Latorah B'Shat Adchak. Can you call up a heretic and give a heretic an aliyah in an emergency situation? What is it? What's a heretic? What's an emergency situation? Well, before we get to that, let me tell you. I have to tell you a little bit about the history here and what's, what's the background of this uh, uh, teshuva. Um, I mentioned already that I was a student at Brandeis University and then I worked there. So uh, I come to Brandeis University in 1985. Uh, um, Brandeis for um, 
at least 15 years had had what you call an orthodox advisor, namely someone who uh, hired by uh, the uh, by the Hillel to uh, minister to the Orthodox students. What that meant was uh, he would come, and it was always a he, even though uh, they weren't necessarily rabbis, most of them were not. Uh, they'd come on Shabbos every other week, they'd give a shear, they'd run the minion, that, that sort of thing. Uh, Marty Lakshin, who spoke for Torah Motion, served in that role briefly uh, in the 70s. I think Howard Kreisel served in that role. Rod Lojauer, Moshe Simkovich, uh, a number of... Uh, uh, of people, sir, and mo many of them were graduate students, and they were doing this uh, on the on the side uh, to make some money. Um, the Hillel was run by a man named Rabbi Albert Axelrod. He's alive today. Uh, I want to show you his picture. This is how what he looked like when I went there. Um, he was a reform rabbi, graduate of Flatbush, by the way, reform rabbi, a well-known peace activist on the left. He had the distinction of um, Marvin Antelman, if the name means anything to you, rented a hotel room outside of Boston, him and two other people, and they put the entire new Jewish agenda, Noam Chomsky and Albert Axelrod in Cherem. At the same time, they did a whole ceremony with a shofar and candles and the whole bit, and he was very proud of the, that, uh, Rabbi Axelrod. Now, Rabbi Axelrod uh, was a wonderful man. I knew him as a student, and I knew him um, having uh, worked there, as we'll see. The problem was that uh, he was a reform rabbi, and he was really reformed. He, um, he did intermarriages in the 80s. Most reform rabbis did do intermarriages in those days. And uh, for the Orthodox students coming off a year of Israel, seeing Rabbi Axelrod, they, they didn't know what to make of this. And there was a lot of negative uh, feelings. When I tell you that he, but he did so much, and we'll see behind the scenes to help the Orthodox student body. Just to give you an example, of why I say um, he really was a wonderful person. And I'll read more of these later. I wanna read you something. I'm embarrassed uh, to read it, but I'll read it anyway. Um, I'm embarrassed because you know you write things when, you, when you're young. Uh, um, it's from 1987. I, um, believe it or not, um, I won an award from the Hebrew Union College. They had an essay contest. And I, about the situation in Israel, religious, non-religious, and, and I wrote an essay and I won it. And the, the prize was to go to Israel for the summer and take classes at the Hebrew Union College there. And uh, I wasn't interested. I turned it down. What am I going to do at the Hebrew Union College? Um, in fact, the guy calls me up, tries to convince me to go. He says, do you know how much, that, how many thousands of dollars you're giving up here? Whatever. But I need to, what am I going to do in the Hebrew Union College? But so it's on my CV that I am the uh, Hebrew Union College award winner. Rabbi Axelrod, at the time, we didn't know each other. He wrote me a letter because he must have got the news that, you know, a Brandeis student has it. Uh, I, this was, I was uh, just beginning. Uh, now, this is, uh, I was actually going to uh, England, uh, but uh, this was right before my junior year. He writes me asking me to, if I could, you know, how proud he is, and can I, do I plan on becoming more involved with the reform minion? You know, because he's never seen me in two years. So I write as follows to him. It's a terrible thing. I'm not happy. I'm not proud of what I wrote. I wrote it because he always said, and I heard from people, he always wanted you to tell the truth, what you thought. He debated Mayor Kahana. He, the Orthodox students, would. he wanted them, you know, they'd write these things to him in the newspaper and he'd be good. I want to hear what you think. So I figured I'd write to him, but I'm embarrassed because uh, what do I need? Like I said, a good Israel will give me an award, but I'm. what I wrote is, let me just, Concerning becoming more involved with the reform group, I have to decline. I say that I support full freedom for reform Jews in Israel, but I fully agree with the Rav's position. A synagogue without a machitza is unfit for prayer. Uh, I don't. I go on to say I don't believe that conservative synagogues are Christianized, but from day one, reform has adopted an approach geared to coming more into line with Christianity. How else explain certain great reform leaders' desire to move Shabbat to Sunday, the confirmation ceremony, the bearing of heads, those reform tendencies which are not geared to Christianity are geared to secularism, which reform calls modernity. I go on and on, blasting reform, and then uh, say, you know, I know you like to hear the truth, so here I am. So what? It's a lot of chutzpah. I mean, he's he's inviting, he's thanking me, you know, he's congratulating me, and I didn't need to, uh, but you know, you go to Israel sometimes, and they turn you in, into a bit of a uh, kanai. I, I go on to say how the future of reform is just like the Karaites. It'll become a sect like the Karaites, for that is the fate of all who abandon the Torah. Really tough stuff. Like I said, this will... <laughs> uh, 
And to his credit, despite that, and despite another thing, I wrote him another later attacking him. He wrote a thing on conscientious objection. I told him how crazy this is. He still would hire me a few years later as the Orthodox advisor. So, I mean, I have such respect for the man and you'll hear later on. So how did I become the Orthodox advisor? Okay. My, my uh, no, the junior year, uh, I was not there. I was in Oxford. Uh, the following happened. There was a, I would come back though. When I came back, uh, I came back, they do trimesters. So I came back and then I went up to Brandeis. So I knew what was going on. And I knew the person, the Orthodox advisor who this was involved with, uh, but I was not there the weekend it happened. We got a new Orthodox advisor. The first year I was there was Rabbi Lazarus from um, Framingham, Massachusetts. He's a Chabad rabbi, very interesting, nice. Um, then we had Rabbi Mark Gopin, my sophomore year. So junior year is a YU guy to the right. And he decided that uh, he's not going to give Rabbi Axarod an aliyah. Now, Rabbi Axarod would come once a year to the Orthodox service. He's the one that gave the money to pay for the Orthodox. He didn't have to do this to pay for the Orthodox advisor. He's the one that came up with the money for the Erev. You know, he did all these things, which, and many more, which I later learned that he didn't need to do. Um, he, he could have done things, you know, just basic. Let's say he, he ran the hero, so he could have made a decision that we don't need to do this. Even he actually encouraged an, an Orthodox minion, maybe because he was nostalgic for his youth or whatever it was. Uh, and he would come once a year, and he would always get an aliyah. No one ever thought anything of it. So the the new rabbi we have uh, tells the uh, the gabbai, uh, don't give him an aliyah. Can't give him an aliyah. Because he's not a heretic, he's not Bikaris. And really, he is not Bikaris because he went to Flatbush. He knows. Uh, most Reformed rabbis don't know anything. Uh, he knows. But how could you not give him an aliyah? But on the other hand, the rabbi says, yeah, you have to listen to the rabbi. We always listen to the rabbi. And I was a freshman. The Chabad rabbi told us we couldn't carry the Torah around the women's side. We always would carry the Torah around the women's side. So what did the students? The students revolted. They couldn't carry it around if the rabbi said not to. Instead, we didn't carry it. So we took the Torah out and we just, we stood at the ark and, you know, Mizmar uh, Ladovid and, uh, you know, we stood there and we took it out. We just stood there. That was our little protest. Um, so you have to listen to the rabbi. So he didn't give him an aliyah. And then this becomes a big, uh, Rabbi Axarod sees what's going on. He wants, and, uh, you know, people were saying, I, I guess Rabbi Axarod, it's not us, it's this. And he comes over and he made it worse, the, the rabbi. He says, to, he says, if you observe two Shabbos in a row, I personally will call you up. And Rabbi Axelrod replied back, you know, my relationship with the Ribono Sholem is between him and me, you know, not, and it becomes a fighting match. And the, the rabbi said something he shouldn't have said. He said that the heart, it's, Rabbi Axelrod had recently had a heart attack. A young guy, now he's in his 80s, so he was young then. Uh, he, he said, the heart attack you had, God was sending you a message. So, needless to say, that Motzei Shabbos, the Orthodox advisor is fired. He didn't go away though, he was fired, but he didn't go away. He remained on campus and he tried to get the students, he wanted us to create a real Auschwitzgemeinde, like in Germany. He said that we'll create a separatist Orthodox community, totally independent from Hillel, and he had lined up the money, he told us, from New York to fund this. You can only imagine, he probably went to these rich Orthodox mockers in New York and said that a reform rabbi is persecuting the Orthodox students and we need to create a separate community. And so it was a total separate community and the, um, the, the students wanted nothing of it. And, uh, and then there wasn't, um, for the rest of the 11th, the rest of um, that year, um, there wasn't, uh, no, no, sorry, this was my senior year. I'm sorry, but I wasn't there at Chavez. There wasn't any Orthodox advisor. Yeah, I was. it was my senior year, but I was not in there at Chavez. Then the next year, there, they had Arya Cohen for a, a period, I don't know how many months, and then he, he didn't last. And then there was a complete year without any Orthodox advisor. And then they called me if I wanted to uh, run the, run the minion. And the problem was, obviously, and this was explicitly asked to me beforehand, would I give Rabbi Axarod an aliyah? So there we get the question. And understand what this means. There hasn't been an Orthodox advisor now for about a year and a half. There's no uh, guidance for the students. And uh, so you have, an, but you have Ramosha Feinstein's tshuva that uh, you can't. So um, I still need to tell a little bit two or three more minutes of background we can do next class i need to tell you how the one time actually let's take two more minutes since we're on a topic and next week we can go right into halacha what rebbe hinkin said so the, when the, the whole thing 
broke apart and Rabbi uh, Sidon, I don't want to say his name, I said it, okay, sorry, was let go. Uh, people started calling different rabbis. Someone actually called Chaim Soloveitchik and asked Chaim Soloveitchik, what would the Rav say? Could we give him an aliyah, Rav Axel, an aliyah or not? And Chaim said, well, you know, my father did used to give a reform rabbi an aliyah, but this wasn't really a reform rabbi, it was a conservative rabbi in a reform shul, and he used to give a lot of money to right-wing yeshiva, so it's different. So he, he of course, didn't want to give us an answer. Um, so I had, then was stuck with the problem, what to do. And I would turn to Rabbi, Hen Rabbi Henkin, and we'll see how he replies, and uh, the different uh, modalities and the problems that come up. I do want to say, though, that there was a time that Rabbi Aksara did break his model of always supporting the Orthodox community. And as I said, he did it and you'll hear more stuff behind the scenes. I only have the best feelings uh, uh, for him, but there's one more event I'll tell you. And I'm telling you this, I wrote about some of this in the Bob, but it's also good to get it on the record. And this was when, we'll take five more minutes and then I'll take the questions when uh, uh, a certain personality came to speak at Brandeis. Brandeis, was a very like pluralistic type of place that, that we each had would have our own mignoni, but then we would come together for the meal. And that's gonna be relevant for another tshuva of a hinted about a woman saying kiddush. But um, then we'd go for an onig Friday night. And everything was done, al pi halacha, even if, if, if let's say the reform were sponsoring the onig, you know, some speaker, nothing, there, no violation of Shabbos. When I was working there already, uh, Rabbi Axelrod calls me in and we have a meeting, him, me, and the conservative rabbi, they have a chance to get Dr. Ruth Westheimer to come speak. For the young people, you might not remember, Dr. Ruth uh, Westheimer, uh, she became known as a, a sex therapist on the TV, on the radio. If you grew up in New Jersey, you remember her, I think it was WR, I remember because I think it was in 1983, when I was a junior, all of a sudden, I never heard of her. My school, JEC, sends home a letter to all the parents, no, no, the Bury, the girls' school, to all the girls, that the mothers should not let their daughters listen to this. Now, of course, uh, most of us have never heard of this, but as soon as you send home a letter telling them not to, if you can imagine what they're doing next Sunday night, everyone's wondering what's so, what's uh, like the Proverbs say, you know, if it's forbidden, it's sweeter. And then, uh, so then everyone knows. And how can you prevent a kid from listening to, uh, uh, the radio, and it, it was the whole novelty of this, you know, this older woman, she wasn't so old, she's I think 56 then, uh, but we, she, we thought she was some old timer, and she's speaking about all this sort of stuff, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, but she's someone who grew up in a traditional Jewish home, she went to Israel, and she was going to come speak at Brandeis Friday night on um, her experience of growing up Jewish in Germany. Someone was sponsoring it, and it had to be Friday night, and the problem was that Dr. Ruth said she couldn't speak unless she had a microphone, because uh, her voice was low. So Rabbi Axarad, I, I think he brought us together to tell me, not to really discuss, but he wanted to discuss, can we have a microphone? And I said, of course he can't have a microphone. Uh, you know, this, this, we're not at Union College. If there's no Shomer Shabbos kids, you all can do what they want. But I mean, this is the status quo here. You can't have an event uh, if there's a microphone. But then he, and then he turned to the conservative rabbi and who never, she never would cross me. But uh, he asked her, what do you think? And she said, well, you know, we use a microphone in shul. So obviously what kind of question is it? So he said, okay, well, I'm, we're gonna have to ha have it. And I said, well, then the, the Orthodox can't come. We've never ever boycotted. We never not come. Uh, and I think it's, I said, I think it's a terrible thing. You're, you're putting an event that we in the Orthodox community can't go to, but whatever. So I made an announcement that uh, the Orthodox community, I'm not speaking strict halacha. Maybe you can make a case. You're sitting in the first row. You can hear it without the microphone. It's just, you can't go to an event, which is, um, you know, violating Shabbos like this by a Jewish organization. Uh, um, so I make the announcement Friday night that uh, you know this is my opinion that we none of us should go. And as the, I guess fifty percent of the students didn't go. And for a modern Orthodox rabbi, I guess that's that's doing okay. You know, fifty percent listen to you. You're doing okay. Uh, so in that sense, Rabbi Aksarad, I think he made a mistake on that. But this is the interesting story. End of the story. We're sitting down at the meal. Soon it's benching time, and who comes into the dining room asking where I am? She obviously had heard that the Orthodox students weren't coming, Dr. Ruth. She comes and she sits down next to me and she, she, she's unbelievably apologetic, saying that uh, you know she didn't want to hurt, hurt our feelings or do anything against. She also knows what the horror is she grew up and that she, but she can't speak without a microphone. She sat with us, 
she benched with us. I mean, it's funny, she benched, she didn't wash and she didn't eat bread, but she benched with us and she said she remembered that tune, Baruch HaTah Hashem from her youth. I don't know if she meant in Israel or in Germany. Um, and she was very apologetic. Uh, so now that we set the stage, you have a reform rabbi who clearly from the standard of halacha is a kofer. On the other hand, someone who has done unbelievable stuff to help the community. And also the flip side is that you're not gonna be able to appoint an Orthodox advisor unless he agrees to give an aliyah. At least that's what I was told at the time. And that was the case at the time, Rabbi. I was succeeded by Rabbi Ari Clapper. And he told me he never gave him an aliyah and it wasn't a problem. But at my time, this was actually a question that was asked. Um, so we will say, I turn to Rabbi Huda Ratzel Henkin. Why Rabbi Henkin, not Rabbi Greenblatt, others? Because Rabbi Henkin is someone who had been on a secular university. He, I thought he would have a sense of what's going on. Uh, is that looking for a head there? I guess you can say to a certain extent, but is there anything wrong with that? We'll talk later on in a future class. Is there anything wrong with that? There's a whole chew from Rabbi Ratzel beyond that. So I, I went a little bit over, so we will stop now. We've set the stage. Boy, I didn't think we'd, one class, only one shuva, one and a half. But well, what can we say? It's Rabbi Tarfon says the work is for us to do. We don't necessarily have to finish. But stay tuned for next week, Rabbi Yehuda Ritzelhenkin, the first of his groundbreaking tshuva to me uh, on these sort of modern cultural issues. Let me now take a few of the questions and comments. Um, ah, so Alan says, Leavdo, it's a kamatz katan. Ah. Okay, but Etchem is not, so that's a good example. Um, oh, it's not a Kamatz Katan. You're saying it's a Kamatz, Ray or Kamatz. Okay, so then I take that back. Ah, so Yair says he passed away, the, the person whose picture I showed you before. Very interesting. Susanna Levin says it's amazing they printed that. Well, when you say they printed it, it's, it's not amazing because the students did it. And yes, there's supposed to be someone who uh, oversees it, but who knows how carefully they look. What's amazing is the students. It's the student change. Because when I went to high school, they wouldn't have allowed that in either. But the students wouldn't have cared. So you see the type of student and how Torah Vidas has changed. I encourage, oh, I oh, know, Shinus is Rabbi Dockin died in 2008. Uh, the Force Tagada. Unbelievable, Mel says. So I encourage everyone to go look. I downloaded all the uh, yearbooks because who knows what other interesting things there are in the yearbooks. Maybe some of them mock some of the rabbis. Who knows? Uh, uh, Kay Shiner says that in Rabbi Lichtenstein's speech at the centennial, he proudly mentioned the influence of his father and grandfather on him. So then I wonder why the book, sometimes they're more pious than the Pope. Um, the, the book is a good book though. The pictures are unbelievable and they do tell the history, the founding of Torah Vadas authentically. They don't cover up Rabbi Zev Gold or anything else. They mention Mizrahi. But at the end of the book, I, where, where they mention appointing him, I mean, Ravi Ruving Ozovsky was involved with Torah Vidas, sure. Uh, he was Rosh Shiva there, but uh, his wife's grandfather, I mean, uh, and not mention he, not to mention, it's it's unbelievable. Ah, so David gives the link there, a treasure trove. Uh, Jack says the Moachim had a shul in Williamsburg in 1560. Don't know if it's still there. There still are Moachim. So I imagine they still have a shul. Many of you right, recall when uh, the Satmar in the 70s burnt the Rebbe in effigy. It actually wasn't the Satmars, it was the Malachim. But the Malachim sort of like hang out and, uh, and are with the Satmars. Uh, so people, uh, if you look at uh, Jerome Mintz's uh, book, Hasidic People, his whole chapter on the, uh, the Malachim, um, they're attached to the Satmar and uh, they, 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 they put the Rebbe up on the thing and they burnt him. Uh, that had significance to the Scranton Jewish community because the Scranton Jewish community had a, used to have a very small uh, Shrita by the Fink family, my former landlords. And um, I was once told the story by David Fink how they became so big. Um, what happened was um, until the, the burning of the eff in effigy, Chabad would buy all their chickens from under Satmar Hashkacha. But after this happened, and after Satmar did not base them, did not condemn it or anything like that, they then needed to find a new uh, chicken manufacturer, new Hashkacha. And lo and behold, uh, that's when David Fink Fink's poultry out of Scranton, which is basically the exclusive, you know, Chabad poultry, they, Crown Heights Ashkacha then puts it on uh, David Elliott poultry, and that, uh, and it's history, then that's the history of how it became so big, and it became the Chabad chickens. Uh, if you know David Elliott poultry, I heard this from David 
Fink myself. David Fink, when I knew him, I lived in Scranton. David lived across the street from me and he had just remarried. His second wife was Rabbi Louis Bernstein's widow. David, thank you for giving us Rabbi Lamb's The Links. In addition to the homiletics, they include a great historical review of contemporary events. Yes, indeed. Chaim Maltz tells us that Rabbi Yaakov Shur, Rabbi Yishur's brother, became the leader of the Malachim. Um, so I guess <laughs> through that Tarvadas influence. Someone says, explain the connection between sex and praying. Who said that? Well, um, let's just say it's the movement. And uh, if you look at it, the similar looking movement. This was said by um, it's one of the Hasidic uh, teachers. Uh, oh, here it is. It's in like Mukuchi Mikarim. Uh, this includes uh, writings of a number of Hasidic masters. I, 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 in one of my Svarenbach posts, I actually uh, included a picture of this. I can send it to you. Kainer, K. Shiner or Kefet has a lecture about the battle to become a use president. I'm sure he does. The problem is we don't have the inside scoop. All we have are stories. I've heard the same stories. I heard stories. I heard stories from Rackman. Rackman wanted me to write his autobiography, write his biography. He was going to actually pay me a lot of money. It broke down because he wanted to have final say. He wanted to read all the chapters and have comments. And I said, I can't do that. If I'm going to write it, it's going to be an actual real biography because the story is a very interesting story, Rackman. Um, so I interviewed him and, I, and from his person, he told me the Rav supported him. And he said, you could ask Torsky. And Isdor Torsky would acknowledge that. I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, and we know that the Rav, uh, I mean, he publicly attacked uh, uh, Rackman's position. Um, although I don't know if his publicly attacking Rackman's position on the Tavo Mate of Tandu was before or after. I think it was, it might've been after this. I don't know the year. Uh, no, no, it was before, it was before. But be that as it may, um, they, it wasn't the only time he attacked him. He attacked him ideas of his at other times as well. But he, so I, I find that difficult to imagine, but Lamb was young and inexperienced in terms of running an institution, whereas Rackman had been assistant to the president. So uh, I don't know. We, what we don't have, and what Gurak's book does not do, is really interview people and get to the bottom line. What was the debate? Why did they decide to go to Lamb? Why, what were they afraid of going to Rackman? Rackman had all this experience and was Rackman was like the closest friend to Samuel Belkin. Um, so that we don't have uh, really an inside story. Uh, there was a, uh, a student representative on this who told me uh, what he remembers from it. David says the Dora V says the only difference in Torah and science is that science was given to all humanity, but Torah was only given uh, to Israel. That's interesting. Uh, is that in the introduction, David, uh, to the Daravi? Okay, were, were Rav Henkin's sons uh, religious? Uh, yeah, they were religious, um, but uh, not modern Orthodox, I guess you could say. Did Rav Henkin have any daughters? I, I don't believe so. Um, someone asked me privately, did Rabbi Lamb ever speak to me about my book, The Limits of Orthodox Theology? Actually, since you ask, I'll say it. Uh, actually, and I, I don't want to say it because he made a very harsh comment about a certain uh, Rosh Hashiva and uh, something. And uh, and I, I changed something was in the book in the second edition to be softer. He said, I shouldn't have changed it. He said, I should have kept what, um, if you could figure it out, you could figure it out. If not, uh, so we did uh, discuss that aspect. Uh, he, he, he told me I made a mistake in trying to change a harsh comment I made there. Um, Mel says the law professor was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, and of course, uh, Rabbi uh, Atom Hankins' uh, uh, father was uh, religious, and uh, no, sorry, Rev, uh, grandfa Rev Atom Hankins' grandfather, Rev um, Uritz Hankins' father. There was one who died young, one of the sons. Um, yes, I Rabbi Nate Hankins, exactly. Um, yes, they all were religious. Um, um, Yes, I know so we, someone who emailed me privately. I know about uh, Hamayan. I know about the, the connection. Mordechai Breuer was very close to uh, Herman Merkin. He used to stay with him when he went there. Um, Shiner tells us from Hankin's father, Hilla was a teacher in Jewish school in New Haven, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, ah, yes, Common Shiner says, a third, K. Shiner, a third son of Rabbi Hankin died as a teenager, is buried next to his father, a few rows behind Heschel. Age of Rabbi Heschel. I, I gave a picture in one of my Swarenbach posts of this uh, son. Um, okay, anything else? Um, was he religious while at JTS? Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Zahav says Dr. Ruth was pre-1948 in the Jewish resistance. Yes. 
Undoubtedly, Rav Axelrod had received Aliyah over the years. There were no previous advisors who gave him Aliyah. Every advisor gave him Aliyah. Now, you take Rabbi Lazarus, the Chabad rabbi, or maybe Chabad's not a good example, he's Chabad, or any of them. It, it, it doesn't mean that they came. Rabbi Axelrod, Rabbi Axelrod might have come on a weekend. They weren't there, but they, everyone gave him an Aliyah. It was, it was an unbelievable shock. And the, uh, the Orthodox advisor, he never uh, asked anyone, as far as I know, maybe he did ask someone, but uh, he went about it all wrong. If he was gonna do that, this is something you have to tell the Orthodox minion ahead of time. You need to tell them there might be an issue. You can't just tell the Gabbai on the spot not to give him an aliyah. Um, wasn't the final torpedo in Rackman's candidacy, the Rubs direct repudiation? Yeah, uh, does anyone remember what year that was? Uh, can type it in. I could find it very easily, but... Uh, um, I believe that was 75, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the problem is 75 is when um, Lamb becomes president, so I'm not sure. It's the ICA convention, the Rav attacked the, the, the Republic. Yeah, Democratic but I don't know if that's before or after the presidency. But he had also, he had made comments, um, Rackman had come out with some liberal ideas. And uh, so I'm not sure about that, if that's, uh, I, I think it was before. Um, I don't know, Hyman. You have to understand something that to the Rav today is not the Rav then. The fact that the Rav opposed someone doesn't mean he does, becomes president. The Rav, for instance, was very opposed to changing the charter of YU. But the Rav was a hired employee, a Rosh Yeshiva. It's not like today. There was a number of Rosh Yeshiva. The Rav was the most distinguished, but uh, the board wasn't asking the Rav what to do. The board was making their own decisions. And uh, the Rav's if, uh, and the fact that the Rav had a disagreement on uh, a Hashkafic matter, uh, when Chaim came in and started reading things, as supposedly they say, out of uh, one man's Judaism of Rachman and said this could be a problem, uh, that would have more influence. The fact that the Rav, uh, I asked Chaim Soloveitchik himself, just to, this I've never told anyone, but I'll say it publicly now. I don't think Chaim would be upset. Uh, the Rav's position is an unusual position. I mean, what's, uh, why is this chazak any different than any other chazak? In fact, one place the Rav speaks of other chazakas like this as well. I asked Chaim, why did the Rav, what was the Rav's thinking on this? And uh, Chaim himself says he doesn't know, he doesn't understand. Why should this chazaka be different than anyone else? Rav Yashif in one place actually says about Tavamet of Tandu, basically says that it's no different, it could change. And we have others who say that. Uh, I think the Doravi, in fact, says it in the Tshuva. Um, so the fact that the Rav uh, attacked Rabbi Rachman for some... Um, thing that no one on the board would even understand. And if they did understand it, they might think it's, well, it's a halachic debate. Uh, Ramosha seems to agree with Rachman in Chuvos. So I don't think, uh, you know, it's not, today the Rav is, I mean, the Rav could not determine who the president was going to be. The Rav wanted to be president once, but he could not determine who the president was going to be in that uh, area. And even after that, the Rav still was a very friendly to Rachman. He said to Rackman that, you know, I, I, I look at matters, uh, what do you say, metahalachically, you look at halachically or something. Uh, he never turned against Rackman other than sharply criticizing. Even someone who was way much more to the left, Yitz Greenberg. The Rav obviously didn't believe in Yitz Greenberg's ideas. He never turned on him and he refused to publicly condemn him. And he never would condemn Yitz Greenberg. And uh, so the Rav, it, it's, I wouldn't say that. Jack says in the Educational Alliance in the Lower East Side in the 50s, there would be a speakers program Friday nights. The speakers often use a microphone. Many from people, even Hasim, if you correct, recall correctly, attended. There was usually a question and answer session afterward. The firm attendees would ever ask the speaker not to use the microphone for his response if they wanted to ask a question. And they would only ask questions that the speaker agreed. Okay, that's interesting. I, although there weren't any rabbis there, and I don't know if they would ask a shayla if you can go. And maybe halakhically, if you're halakhically, there's not a problem at all. Um, because they're doing it anyway, they're speaking in. But this, of course, was a different, this was a slap in the face to the Orthodox community. Every single Hillel event since the beginning of time uh, would have, um, you know, there wouldn't be any Hillel Shabbos. And, and to say, now we're gonna start any Hillel Shabbos, what are they gonna do next time? They're gonna have the, the food at the Onig is not gonna be kosher. By the way, since I mentioned Yitz Greenberg, Yitz Greenberg was the Hillel advisor, not the one directly before Al Axelrod, but 1957, he was the Hillel advisor. He's the one that made the cafeteria kosher. I mean, they called it kosher, but it really wasn't kosher. They didn't have pork or anything, but there wasn't, no one was watching, no mashkiach or anything. So Yitz Greenberg gets uh, the credit um, 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 for that. Um, uh, didn't JTS act as a sort of finishing school for Orthodox rabbis? 
in the 1930s and 40s, and 40s in particular, most JTS Musmachim came out of Yeshiva College. That is a fact. And uh, that went on into the 50s uh, also. Uh, per Alan Brill, the popular nigun for not Birchat Amazon, it should be Birchat Amazon, was commissioned by Ramordechai Kaplan for the Amida. I did not know that. Interesting. Um, um, someone asked, did Ramosha respect the Hachtsis or of Henkin? Very much so. Rav Henkin was one of the few people that Ramosha would consult if he had a questions. Of course, they were neighbors, <laughs> so it was easy. Uh, they had a huge machokas over the status of civil marriage, <clears throat> but that did not affect even in the slightest their regard for each other. And uh, the difference, of course, is that Ramosha became a national and then an international postsake. Rav Henkin never was an international postsake in the sense that people, let's say, in South Africa would be writing asking questions, that sort of thing. Uh, um, so someone says that the lecture was given in 75, a year before he became a vile candidacy. Okay, so we see that the Rav attacked Rackman's position before the presidency. Thank you very much. And finally, someone asked me about the recently published Chuvos two volumes, Gevura Selyahu of Rav Yosef Yohekin. Any censorship on the footnotes clearly? There is no censorship uh, as far as I know. It, it, I don't think there could have been. He worked very closely with Eitam Henkin, even though he's from the Haredi world, he worked very closely with Eitam Henkin. Eitam Henkin never would have allowed any censorship. It has lots of good stuff, unpublished stuff, as well as stuff from uh, various journals. Is my, the best part of it, which I sent to Rav Mazuz, and then he quoted it in one of his Motsi Shabbos talks, Rabbi Henkin writes about, even though he obviously comes from the Ashkenazic world, uh, that diktuk is important. We need to know diktuk, and unfortunately it's not studied. Uh, one of the good things, <laughs> He also, one of the things about Rav Henkin, I don't know why it just popped in my mind, is that he was very much against this, this practice they used to do in the yeshivas of having a break uh, after, was it after Tkiyas Shofar to, or was it before Tkiyas Shofar before, after? Well, he was very much against having a kiddish before Tkiyas Shofar. Tkiyas Shofar, which I never understood. We did it in my show one year. It just, uh, and he's very sharp against it. Rabbi Gifter actually writes very sharply to Rabbi Henkin how could you speak this way against our yeshiva shminhug? This is what all the yeshivas do, and uh, Rav Henkin, uh, and also, I think you got to, in my classes on Rav Henkin, we speak a lot about Rav Henkin. I encourage everyone to listen to it. I love the fact, I don't love Rav Henkin, you know, he's, he writes all about the rent control on this, but I love the fact of Rav Henkin, who was an anti-Zionist, a big anti-Zionist, he didn't believe, he thought it was dangerous. Once the state is declared, then all of a sudden he's has, then you have to be a Zionist, in the sense that you have to support the state of Israel, and uh, you have to, uh, sort of like the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay, this has been fun. Uh, oh, one more question and I'll end it privately. Um, someone emailed me that texted me that Rabbi Lamb once told him that he was opposed to religious parties in Israel. Um, that's not so crazy. Um, I think Mordechai Breuer was opposed to it. Uh, you, you can have religious, we don't have religious parties in uh, other countries. You can have religious people in the Likud, in the Labor Party. What do you need to have a party whose whole uh, agenda is about religion? Um, someone texted me privately, or Varen Color also attacked Rav Henkin on the Kiddush. Ah, that I didn't know that. And uh, um, thank you uh, all for this. Uh, it was very nice. Sorry if I kept you a little late. If those people who left, you can come back and listen to the YouTube and uh, see you all next week. At this rate, we're going to be here a long, long time. But I'm having fun, so I hope you were.